<laughs> we'll see. Okay. We are going to go ahead and start recording. And we are talking about chapter eight first. So just going through this real quick. Um, we already have chapter seven again. Chapter seven and eight were together in the in the file that I gave you. We went through chapter seven, which was about the regular film. We talked about the different parts and how we have different film sizes, right, and speeds, right. Remember, the A was the slowest, right, and the F was the fastest speed. And what else we have that we talked about the film packet and what are the different parts of the film packet are and what they're used for. We talked about the dot that we have here to do, do, do the foil and all of these kind of good things and how actually the film get exposed and the x-ray would appear on a regular film and then the developing process and all these chemicals. And then we have the automatic process. And now we got uh, radiography. So uh, that's the good thing that happened. We now all offices. We have only one office that was still doing man like paper films or whatever you call these. And I think we just got a new digital films now. So much probably office that you're going to go to will have any of the you know paper films it's all big. and again it can be a sensor and we'll see we'll get to know the different uh, types and ways to do digital x-ray can be a sensor that is so uh, with the digital, we're saying more digital imaging than graphy right Instead of taking an, a radiograph, we'll say acquire an image technically. Just like when we were saying, you know, a template replace um, a mount, right? An orientation replace mounting x rays. So it's just a few different terms for the digital uh, type of things. So definitely requires a computer, a software, and a sensor. And generally, we have three sensors in a way. So we have a direct wired sensors just like the ones that you guys have in the lab right we have that in the lab we use it and then we have also direct wireless sensors so technically they just made a a thing to it to connect to the computer wirelessly you know wow. yeah so right <laughs> now i'm thinking about that yeah we might actually put it on our wish list just so that we <laughs> and then we have the indirect sensors that are technically not directly. And we did talk about that a little bit before, I think, but we're just going to go through and see that. So definitely uh, there are tons of benefits for the digital imaging. So one of them is the instant view of the image, right? You don't have to wait for the processor again, you know, having went through the chapter at the beginning about the regular x-ray the old x-ray and how we have to go through the chemicals and everything to be able to process the image so this would show you how better the digital x-ray got us right we can see the image right away once we expose it we're not having any more dark room any processing errors that can happen with the chemicals any hazardous waste right the chemicals and the lead foil uh, these are all gone with the digital x-ray. Uh, we can manipulate the images, right? We can change the contrast a little bit, play with that in the computer, maximize it or magnify it, and all of that. Uh, the software would help us, so a lot of good things. And definitely we have less radiation, and we don't have to keep the x-rays somewhere else. If the patient needs a duplicate, we can send it, email it to them. So a lot of good things, you know, with the digital x-ray, definitely. And you can see some of these uh, softwares will change the color depending on the type of the filling or, you know, so good things. So some challenges that might happen with digital x-ray, because it's easy to retake, right, people might tend to do more x-ray. So you're taking it and it's still inside the patient mouth and you see it is not good and you just say, oh, just stay where you are. I'm just going to take another one, right? Uh, this should not happen. We should try our best not to do any retakes. 
Uh, and that's why we're training in here to get our x-rays right from the beginning. Um, that's, that's an important thing. Again, so that's one of the challenges uh, of a digital x-ray. A smaller recording dimensions on some sensors. So you know our sensors sometimes have that bleeding edge that does not record any of the uh, components, right? Like, because it's the plastic that contains the sensor, you know, we are missing a lot of the image because of that, right? Of Not a lot of image, but at least some of the image is missed because of the plastic that covers and protects the, the wired sensors. So some of that thicker sensors, that can be a little bit of problem, right? Wires that hanging out, but nowadays again it's we kind of overcome all these challenges not a big deal much uh compared to the benefits that we're getting uh other concerns now since it's all you know electronic so systems can malfunction computer crashes viruses can happen uh you might not be able to access the image because there are but that goes with anything now right everything now is on computers if not even on the cloud where you don't even have a, a copy of it. So these things um, start, you know, with the digitalization of everything and definitely some upfront expensive equipment when you buy them. And then if you want to update them, you know, you might have some expensive um, updates. So when again remember we talked about the film we have a base and we have emulsion and we have a, a a gelatin that holds everything together that was the regular film so and then when the x-ray hit these silver crystals they turn black and that's how the image comes up right definitely with digital sensors we have pixels just like when you have it on your camera in a way uh or pixels aligned in uh and that will then translate uh, to the image so when you have more pixels you would have higher ready resolution and uh yes All right so like you have 4k tv or 8k tv it means it has more pixels same thing you know It is similar in a way when we were talking contrasts, right? And we said about the, also the scale of the contrast. So, but since this is like an image, so uh, we say it's a, it's a more race scale that it has. So uh, the most important characteristics, computer software can enhance, right? The gray levels. So um, the thing about the digital um, sensors, um, they say, you know, they can get up to even more than that gray levels, but you can see there only 256 gray levels can be displayed on a monitor and a human person or human eye without an aid, without, you know, glasses or anything like that, uh, or without improvement of the software, we can only recognize or distinguish between 32 gray levels. So anyway, this is just telling you that how much it, enhances that and how much of the capacity that it can have with the uh with the details that it can show um but again there is some limitation because at the end of the day we do it on a monitor so that's the amount of gray levels that we can see and this just depends on again how much exposure it gets so for each pixel we'll have a gray value that then will be uh translated by the software to be shown as an image right Again, just depending on the exposure. So now we're talking about the direct, as we said, remember we said we have direct and indirect digital imaging or sensors mainly. We have direct uh, digital sensors and we have indirect. So we're talking about here the direct digital sensor. So these ones will show the image directly on the monitor, right? That's what you guys are taking now. We have one that is wired and we have all of these things inside of it, all the sensors. And it, you know, as you expose it, it appears right away on the monitor. So 
this is how technically it, it goes. This is the process. So the sensor is made of uh, X-ray sensitive cells like we saw there, technically pixels, right? They get excited when they are, get excited. <laughs> and when they have the <laughs> X-ray on them and then the computer would, or the software would actually process these coordinates on each pixel and give them a gray value, which we talked about in the slide there. And this would represent an image on the monitor, right? So an X-ray hit these, they'll get excited, then they get a value and the software would actually uh, display them as an image. Just like when you take a picture with your phone, depending on how much light it gets into these sensors. So these direct sensor types, we have two of them. We have charged couple device, which is CC. Right, and we have that long name, complementary metal oxide semiconductor active pixel sensor. That is the one, right? So these are the main two types of sensors that are direct, direct digital sensors that we have. All good? Um, Definitely, they come in different sizes, similar to like the regular X-ray films. Uh, the dimensions might be slightly, huh? Less or more? Less, smaller, right? Than the film size. So technically, about you know the edges of the film. So like again. They say this is a, a film that is size two. According dimension, it's not a size two film because of the because of the plastic that surrounds it, right? Because of that that area that is not going to be exposed, and we miss part of the film. So the film, the actual recording dimensions will be smaller than the actual. So again, if you picture, you might kind of see how the sensors are smaller than the actual, like this is the sensor here, and it's smaller than the, yeah. They have in, in contoured edges, and this is what Hygiene just purchased last year. Uh, these are kind of, some people prefer these better. You can see they have contoured edges, right? So this would make it a little bit easier for the patient to bite down. It, without having these, you know, rectangular edges of the film, especially, right? <laughs> yeah, especially for that. And you can see how the, you can see how the uh, wire is also bent in a way, again, that makes it, they say, they say they patent this wire placement. Yeah, it was there when they were, when they were doing the, uh, they were doing the presentation to us, you know, and hygiene, and they said like, they're patting it, you know, they're trying to get it patent or they got a patent for the wire placement that is diagonal. <laughs> it's just because they say it's much easier. It would not produce more, you know, wire problems. And anyway, what so, can I come up with that right. and still it gets us what we want to see. So a dynamic range, um, this is a term that we use when we uh, describe the capacity, for example, uh, for these sensors. So it's the range of exposures that are able to produce a diagnostic image. So for example, you can have a narrow or wide. Let's do this so it makes more sense. So a narrow dynamic range means a smaller window of exposure. So if you're trying to get an image, again, we'll see how this would relate to these uh, sensors in a minute. If you, for example, if you want for one of the sensors, uh, their narrower has the smaller dynamic range than other one, like this one has 
a narrower dynamic range than the CD and then the CCD, which means you have to get the actual exposure amount to get a good x-ray. If you go above that amount, most probably you'll get either like grayed out x-ray. If you get a little bit less than that amount, you might get unexposed x-ray in a way. Okay. So it gives you a little bit more limitation with your exposure. That's when you have a narrow dynamic uh, range. And sometimes that doesn't mean it's completely better if you have a wider dynamic range, because then they were saying that if you have a wider dynamic range where you can hit the x-ray at any level, then you're not going to care as much, you know, as low as possibly achievable. You don't really know what's a good exposure. You can actually get the patient to expose a lot of x-ray, more x-ray than needed. Anyway, uh, so you can see here the exposures that are outside of the dynamic range might not capture any image for these type of stuff. It's a term that we use, especially with the sensors that are digital sensors. Again, depending on the uh, how much exposure or the, the range of the exposure that can actually give us a diagnostic image. And this is, again, that's how it relates. So this is a kind of a, a comparison between the two types of sensors, the CCD uh, and the other one. <laughs> so the, this one that has a narrower dynamic range than the other one, than the CCD, uh, it can be wire or wireless. So this is the only one that is a direct sensor. The CMOS ABS sensor is the only direct sensor that can be wireless. And this is technically what is what it would look like, a wireless uh, X-ray, uh, direct X-ray. So it has a device that will be connected to the computer, that can wirelessly connect to the computer and it'll show you the X-ray in there, okay? The similar sensor, we just have a contraption that it will allow us to do it wirelessly. So the newer ones are less expensive, are more common, it might require less computer power to process the images. These are slightly less, sensitive to radiation because again they have a little bit more wider range so that can affect that as well but it's wire 25 percent more radiation over the other ones because again of the less sensitivity of the radiation so these are just differences between these direct sensors that we have one is lower dynamic range can be wired or wireless might require power and the other one have a little bit less sensitivity to radiation and might require more radiation to get a better uh, image. So it has a wider range. Any questions? All good. Now we're done with the direct ones. They will talk about the indirect uh, dental digital imaging. So have you seen these plates, right? I think we did show you in the lab. You know what we call them? PSP. <laughs> Don't have. PSP plates, which is post photostimulable phosphorus plate. Okay, so these are different from the direct one in that um, technically, again, we have to uh, scanner to be. And if you've seen these big machines that we have next to the computers, right, to the X-ray. Uh, Computer, these are the x-ray sent, these are the x-ray uh, readers, what do you call this? This like these devices here. That's a Scanex machine where we put these plates in to be able to scan them to the computer. So that's why it's indirect, because again, it does not show directly onto the computer and it has no wire connection to the computer. So there is a little bit of difference here in the way that the x-ray would be um, produced compared to the direct one. You know, with the direct one, we said that we have pixels that get excited when they get the x-ray and the program would right away uh, be able to, to translate these pixels to a gray level and then show it on the screen. On these, since they're not direct, the actual thing will have... Um, 
phosphorus in it, and that will, when you expose the x-ray energy, it will have more energy, will actually contain that energy into it as a latent image, just like the regular film. And then we have to put it in the scanner that have some kind of laser that will actually be able to read these uh, read these levels of energy that's on the phosphorus and read the image okay and then these images need to be actually do, 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 let's see cause the surgeon is that's what it caused i think i have another slide for that but technically these plates and you know this is the plate this is what we're talking about you guys have seen it again you should have seen it in the lab uh, but you know it's much more Thinner, I think we have a slide for that, but it's thinner, it's a little bit more flexible. So that's why it's a little bit easier on the patient. You know, it's not as rigid, but then having that problem where you have to scan it, which means you have to have enough of these for your exposure. So if you're doing like example, six exposures, you have to have six films. Not like with a direct one, you just have one sensor and you do all your exposures with the same sensor, right? So that's the problems with that. But again, and you have to bring them in, scan them in. So it gives back the processing part of the, of the manual x-ray where you have to do processing of the x-ray. They have a wider range and less sensitivity than the direct sensors. So since we take these x-rays on these plates and we have to place them in a sensor to read them, we have to actually place them in a light tight transfer box when we get it. So we're like, we're beside, we're beside the patient. We take the x-ray and then we put them in this transfer box type of thing, which is technically just a, a box that is black, but it has Taking like a foaming onto it so that when you place the x-ray on it, it would not uh, get damaged. And then you have to close it and pick it up with you to the scanner uh, and then scan the x-rays. Uh, are light sensitive, not like with the... Any problem. While these ones, if you put them in light, they actually will be deleted or erased. And that's why actually we erase them with light. Yeah, so as, as it goes through this device, it will read them and then expose light to them, like actual bright light, and then it can erase them and you can reuse them again. So you put them, it will read it, it will erase it, and you can read it. light sensitive again not like the other ones that are direct and that's again just shows you the uh the different the differences between these uh direct and indirect uh digital sensors and that's why most probably these are in their way to go out you know because there's a lot of things that are related to them you have to buy the devices and you have to buy multiple of these and then all these kind of things so the direct ones are a little bit easier uh, it's just they are a little bit uh, tougher on the patient. So the direct ones compared to the indirect ones, the direct ones have narrow, the indirect ones have wide. And then you can see, I mean, these are just a compare. So you can see there's almost right away, you can see the image here. You have to process it and scan it. Uh, they are thick, rigid sensors, less comfortable or tolerate by the patient. These are more flexible, more tolerate for the patient. These are uh, durable because, again, they're thick, they're rigid. These can be easily damaged or scratched, less likely to be damaged, sensitive to, oh, we cannot also disinfect them. They have a specific disinfectant wipes that we can wipe with. Um, the problem with these is that the cord usually is the problem. So, yeah, yeah, we, we cannot. Yeah, I mean, we, that's why we covered exactly. We covered with the with the plastic cover, but we cannot sterilize them, right? You cannot put them there. They're just they're uh, digital things, just like you cannot put your phone in there. That's right. So. Uh, 
we usually just wipe them. We have specific, you know, special wipes for them uh, that can clean them up. And that's why infection control when we are using these uh, sensors are very important because you don't want to get it to be cross-contaminated and then use it on another patient. Yeah. But by the way, I mean, these would have, these would have a, a, a container, an envelope that we put them in them. So we don't use them th like that. We put them in an envelope, we close it, and then we use it, and then we break the envelope and we take the x-ray out. So it's, it will be covered. It will not be used just directly. It will be covered with a, with a plastic envelope. And you'll see that again, you'll use these. Um, so that, that will protect them a little bit as well. As far as, um, that was a, will be a question for Dr. Ospina because he, yeah, he, he scheduled that, but I think it will be next semester because we're almost there for this semester. I'm sure we'll have. Uh, required packaging and preparing. So that's another problem. You have to package them. At the end here, I put up an image. What do you think this is? Well, it is a panoramic image. On in here, right? Yeah. So that's the that's the next level. That that should come already. I mean, again, our phones now. You can put your phone and you do your, you have a Google Lens or I don't know Apple whatever they have. Definitely. So, I mean, computer power and the iPad and can figure out anything. This is already there. I mean, there are companies that offer that. I think. That's where I got it. I got it from their website, actually. Uh, but it's not yet to the consumer level, I guess, where all dentists would have it. But again, I think in, in the near future, you know, you just take your x-rays that we mounted directly. They'll tell you exactly what's going on with the patient, you know, and they'll be better than humans because now, yeah, they, they train robots and they train AI. Well, AI, let's say, not robots. They train AI to, to figure out what's going on with like the, uh, they have these slides, what do you call these? Like microscopic slides of tissues and they can figure out like if the tissues have cancer, not better than a human would be. Yeah, so, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's again, it's it's going there. We already have the technology. It's just a matter of, making it more accessible or people buying it. It's a software you download on computer most probably and can figure it out. So it's not a, it's going, it's it's getting there. And I, again, I think maybe in a little bit also, a little bit far future, maybe you have a, you know, just a, a thing that goes around and take the X-ray. You don't have to position the X-ray anymore and hold it and do that and this. You just put the out and some chicken, tracing, right? Yeah. yeah. One day, something like <laughs> anyway. Okay, now no, this is a short one, it will not take too, too long. So, um, have you guys seen or heard about? The yeah. So it's like CT scans. Maybe you guys are more familiar with CT, or a lot of people are more familiar with CT scans. And CT scan is a, you know, where a person that thing and it goes to take an x ray of the whole body, right? And you can actually see slices of the body in industry. Yeah. In a small machine that looks like a regular extra oral x-ray film type of thing so it has uh it has an x-ray and it has a sensor and it takes a 3d image of a specific location of your arch that is specifically uh needed or uh helpful when you're trying to implant you want to make sure that you're placing it in the middle of the of the bone and you want to know the exact of the bone and you want to see where the nerves are running through the bone right so they can take a 3D image instead of just a regular 2D image where you cannot really figure out depth. 
you can take a 3D image and then you can see exactly go through back the exact measures and the exact locations of everything and contact treatment so they can see the, the root canals. It's used in uh, uh, implants. It's used in surgery when you have impacted teeth that are not clear. So it's a great advance for dentistry. Uh, they are more expensive, definitely. Surely get a little bit cheaper. Um, that's what that's a, a machine that takes a lot of exposures, tons of exposures to produce a 3D image. That's the well. It The device is similar to that, like the one that we have in the in the in the clinic on the side. And actually, the 3D images also the 3D X-ray machines can take also 2D images. So unless we need a 3D exposure, that's when we activate the option to take a 3D. But usually, the machine looks like the other ones. You know, it looks like the 2D machine. Huh? That's the, yeah, that only takes two, two. I think we're trying to request a new 3D one if we can get. Hopefully, we, I mean, we don't use it here, honestly, like we don't have because this is a lot of exposure for the patient. Again, imagine having a 3D x ray. So that means like taking tons of slices of x rays, like for each one, for one tooth, you're taking tons of exposures, you know, about two pictures to get that, it's a lot of exposure and we only do it when we need it. Again, for an implant and we'll, we'll talk about these, uh, you know, situations where it's, it's preferred and must not, you know, not to you. About how they do it. Tons of other ones, I mean. See, so this one actually takes 2D as well. That's why they said remove these 2D ones. Select the appropriate patient. Select 3D module from the menu on the left or choose Go with 3D imaging from next steps, located on the bottom left of the patient dashboard. Select 3D capture from the 3D imaging dashboard or from the top drop down menu. In the pop up box, select the artifact removal based on the patient. Confirm A2 and IO filter is enabled. On the touchpad of the Plan Mecca Pro Max, select 3D dental, then teeth. In the upper left of the touchpad, choose the patient's size. If the patient's size is questioned, it is better to choose the larger size. So again, I mean, we can choose an area, one tooth, or, you know, groove of teeth, all of that. So it gives us that option. Select to capture extended field of view as needed and in the bin. Press lower, upper, or both. Press forward in the lower right of the touchpad to continue. Choose the appropriate resolution. Enable Plan Mecca Ultra Low Dose if needed. Enable Plan Mecca Calm if available. Have the patient remove glasses, jewelry, all removable appliances, and hair accessories. Have the patient stand tall, hold handles, and walk close to the knee. Instruct the patient to bite down into both grooves of the bite skin. 
Usually we cover that. Raise or lower the unit until the posterior occlusal table is parallel to the floor. Check the bottom of the volume light. Make sure it's below the area of interest. If maxillary is selected, the plan mecaproax arm will rise up from the maxillary. Confirm the bottom of the volume light is in the correct position for the maxilla. Use the curved arrows to adjust the bottom of the volume light. Please note, you need to hold the button down until the arm raises or lowers. Release the bottom when the volume light is below the area of interest. Lower and tighten the 3D head support securely. Align the mid sagittal laser to the ventral midline by moving the chin left or right. If needed on the protach, select 90 degrees. Verify the patient's back and shoulders are not in the path of rotation. This icon is optional depending on the patient's size. Using the thumb wheel, roll the laser in front of the patient's central teeth. This light represents the front of the 3D volume. Press forward on the touch screen and instruct the patient to remain still, close the lips, swallow, and read through the nose. Press and hold the exposure button until all audible noises cease. The image will appear on your computer screen. So you can see, yeah, you can see this is a 3D view. So two different, uh, arch, you know, one like viewing from the top, one viewing from the side, one viewing from the inside, and you can play with it, move in and out to be able to see that. Uh, I was looking for something that is uh, online. I found that one here. Uh, technically, kind of. Oh, what do we have? This this head, right? Yeah. So this technically kind of shows it. Uh, let me. I guess we might need to turn off the light. Let's see. Do we? Thank you, Alex. I should see, I should be able to see, what is that? Thank you. Uh, I should be able to see uh, four of these, not one. But technically, I can move this, you know, slider and see how we're sliding through the patient. And we have different views. So this is like the other view here. Usually we have them in a four configuration, like four pictures. I don't see, I don't see these menus. I cannot see that they're too small. But we can't, we should be able to have them, I guess this maybe. Yeah, let me see. Uh, where's that for? Yeah, so you put this here, you put that here, and then you put this here. Did I put them the same thing? And then when you move this here, you'll see like where are you moving on the other ones. You see that line there? But in a different axis of the, of the, of the patient. See? And then you move here to be able to capture, you know, for example, I want to see the eye because I cannot see the teeth here. They're not that clear, right? So this is, no. now we're in the middle of the eye, correct? If I want to move a little bit more into it here on this side, see, so I can see the eye from the bottom or top. See, now I can see it. And then here, what are we looking at? Oh, we can get it closer from the back to see the eye here. See, now we're looking at the eye from the inside. Yeah. So this is you know, imagine that for a tooth. I mean, we can do that exactly, and we can capture the exact area that we want to look at and look inside of the root canal. And then you have something the amount area, right? A tool, great tool that we can use. So this 
that's that's what it is. So going back here, let's get that done. So it's a 3D image. Can the imaging, as I was saying, you can do that both. Uh, they're better at capturing hard soft. Which is now on call. So that's what even also in the, in the field, like you go to office, they either call cone beam. That's volumetric, right? But Elizabeth, your phone fell. Example here for supernumerity, then it should be. But, uh, was it this year? Right. Here, but earlier, before you got sinus, uh, not a little bit. Anyway, something with a sinus, not a little bit. Anyway, that. Being new technology. Really exact. Oh, that's something that we need to think about when we. As I, there's a lot. So when we are trying to look at something to decide, uh, that was the suggested three categories. The image technically, and then we have the rotation you saw, and 
one fell or partial rotations around the head. You capture a lot of uh, images, receptors that we have in there to software would translate it. The sensors that are used in the CBCT, they're called flat panel detectors. Voxels, instead of pixels, right? Like pixels are used with, we were talking about the, right? The direct sensor is pixels to capture the X-ray. With the 3D CBCT, voxels, and technically, did I put that in here? Yeah, like volume element. So this is, if this is a pixel, a voxel is a little bit more like a, a cube instead of like a 2D uh, thing. So this would capture much more of the radiation to be able to create that 3D image. Right, so da, 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 voxel add a dimension that is a Z, yes, a Z coordinate, right? The depth. So you have X, Y, and then Z is the depth. That's a voxel. So it forms a cube that captures data that produce digital image. Uh, as we were looking at technically an anatomical planes that we have. And we have three main back and forth and you can see kind of we have that software that can construct a 2d or 3d image it can take a little bit of while uh, and images we can do it in different angles as you saw usually presented as slices and so on you know in coronal and axial planes that's how we can see it. again here for example you can see number a as the coronal plane, number B here is the sagittal, and C is the um, axial, right? And then you have usually a 3D image where you can play with and, you know, move around. As we said, because we have a lot of exposure, we have to compared to CT scan is that the CBCT so we can control and we can tell it only maxillary teeth or only uh, posterior teeth on the mandible and so on and so forth. So with the CBCT scan, we cannot because you go through the machine and it captures everything in its way, you know, within a specific region. So that's a good thing about it. Um, and if we want as much as possible to add you to the area that is of interest, so we can keep the exposure as low as usable, and the prescription must be based on assessment and benefits. Instead. Out of exposure. You can range from 29 to 500 something micro severts, which is technically the exposure, right? The x ray dose compared to only seven with a regular panoramic x ray, right? There's a
CBCT scan. This just shows you that we can choose multiple views, field of views here with the CBCT. The last thing as are that might can have some problems with In the first slide, this uh, artifacts that can have a copying artifact because you have a lot of exposure time, right? So, trying to get the patient to stand still within that exposure time you know, you might have a little bit more problem. But as you saw, the machine really gets you fixed. And what you see lines because of the x-ray passing through different objects or two objects that have same density that are closer to each other, like adjacent teeth with metallic restoration. This is how it looked like. You see how these are coming out? So that's an artifact that we see. Artifact, and that's when it passes through uh, a dense object. And you'll see that distortion that can happen there as after it passes through these metal crowns, you see a little bit of uh, you, that artifact that can happen kind of like a cone shaped thing that goes around. But again, these are not that much of a problem because also the software would reduce some of these uh, things that uh, exposures and uh, make it look, look better. And with that, my friends, we are done with our lectures for the uh, exam, right? How about these faces? Better? So, let's stop recording here.